Kia ora koutou. Um, hello to everybody. Good to see everyone together. It's, um, it's like pretty exciting. Uh, like I think Warren, Warren mentioned yesterday that there's been a couple of community enterprise get-togethers over the years in Kaitaia and um, it's always really stimulating to, to get people together who are looking to make some radical change around the place, which is what we require, some radical change. Um, just like to congratulate um, Dai and um, for actually putting it together that it's, this is coming out of council, that they've actually said, hey, we've got to just start looking at different ways of doing things. There's nothing fixed. We haven't sorted anything out. We haven't solved any problems, and we won't hear to, in these two days. But the key is to start, and I think that at the end of the day, um, we've started. So congratulations, Di, um, Ken, Gary, and all the crew from from council have put this all together to actually make it happen. So crucial that we do. It's really exciting. It's refreshing that we're actually starting to talk about alternative ways of economics. So you know, well done, everybody. We really appreciate you putting it together. Um, and um, I suppose the whole concept that um, Shona has been talking about community enterprise is dear to our hearts. Like CBEC is a community enterprise, part of the social enterprise concept. I very clearly draw the line between social enterprise and community enterprise because is quite there is a subtle difference um, and one can be privately owned or group owned whereas community which is social enterprise whereas community enterprise is only there for one purpose it's to do things in the community for community benefit and everything that we make out of that exercise goes 100 percent back into our community so there's a subtle difference but the important thing is social enterprise, community enterprise, it's addressing some of our major problems in, that we face now and into the future. Um, so I suppose when, when uh, CBEC got together um, to start doing the things we're doing, we've always, we were very keen that we were just part of the puzzle, having a really health, healthy private sector, having a really healthy public sector, and a community sector that was flourishing is crucial. You know, if you don't have all three doing well, then you don't have a healthy community. So we set out to support our local businesses in town as well as set up new activities in town that grew our local economy. So um, really interested to hear, um, sh have shown it here because I was very fortunate last year. I I was uh, able to go to the United Kingdom and look at some of the models over there of community enterprise. I looked mainly at the networks rather than the specific activities or organisations, and I was blown away with how much activity out there in the, in the UK. And to be honest, after travelling through UK, uh, the England, Ireland, and Scotland, those amazing examples everywhere. The Scottish model is the model for New Zealand. I came, I came back to New Zealand going, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. The model for community enterprise growth in New Zealand is right there. It's got the system. It's, it knows what it costs. It's had massive growth in the last 10 years. You know, like gone from a very small you know, number of people who were collectively working together as networks to a a massive organisation um, running through a group of people and networks grow, working through this, the whole um, Scottish system. So it can be done. It's now a serious part of the, the Scots economy and it's all, a lot of it's happened in places where nothing else was working. And I think that's the key thing. Away from the mic. Sorry. Yeah, so it's, it's happened in places, you know, whether it's an urban situation or a rural situation, where the system was struggling to initiate improvements and, and growth and activity. So we have a model. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We just need to make sure that Shona stays with the New Zealand giving, you know, and, and keeps bringing that, those good ideas. Um, the other thing I learned from being there was how big can we get community enterprise? And there is no limit. Um, the number of organisations is massive over there. They've got some of the networks I was working with are actually putting are being seconded to government to the British government, like for three six months periods to give them advice on how to develop their communities. You know, serious stuff where they become the, the senior policy makers for government. Then they and then they leave. So really having impact on gov central government policy. 
The other thing is I was fortunate to, to go to Northern Ireland and when we talk about scale, how, can, how big can this get? Um, well, there's a group in Northern Ireland called the Bryson Group and uh, I met up with those and they, they do everything in Northern Ireland. They've got a, such a big range of um, activity. Specifically was interested in their recycling systems that they do, but because of the, our um, CBEX involvement with recycling and waste. But Bryson now runs 60% of the Northern, Northern Ireland's curbside collection. That's equivalent to one community organisation running 60% of New Zealand's curbside services, because it's about four or five million people in, in Northern Ireland. So there is no limit to the scale. They have health services, they have recycling services, so their health services are as big I should care services are as big as their recycling. So massive. So there is no limit. And it's happened again in Northern Ireland where nothing was going to happen. Communities stepped in and made things happen. So a lot of similarities with the, this area here. And I suppose what you see, what C, one thing CBEX learned and what I, I learned from being in those places is that it's that capacity. When you get to a certain size, there's no limit to what you can do. And Bryson was an amazing example of that. Um, uh, so, th but the other interesting thing was that how long, is this a new I idea, a new concept? Well, Bryson's been going since 1910. And, uh, and, and they've got some wonderful documents that show you that history. Um, another group that I, wor I worked with was um, Locality, and they're a combination of uh, development trusts and a, uh, a, the um, BASIC, which was set up in 1880, 1860 by Oxford University and Cambridge, where they sent their graduate students to the, the most depressed areas of London and said, tell us what we need to do about social change. And that formed some of the... So that community enterprise that exists today and that network actually form a lot of the social policy that we, we have in New Zealand right now because it went to England and it came to New Zealand. Anyway, so, you know, there is, you know, there's no, there's no limit to what we can do and um, we absolutely have a place in the economy to actually grow our economy and make it sustainable. Um, sorry, I think I put him to sleep. <laughs> sorry. Okay, shit, okay. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll quickly run through this because there's a couple of other speakers and I don't want to take up too much time, so I'll quickly go through my slides. Yep. Okay, and so I suppose the first one here is, um, is that a chap on the, on the, right, on the right, left hand side, we, we've known about the problems of our environment and social problems for a long, long time. We've been told about it, but we don't seem to to ever get it right and, and make the big changes that we need to. Um, we all grew up with um, Dr. Zeus and, and, his, and his teachings. And so, you know, it's about doing something and actually, you know, and not waiting for anyone else to do it for us. And I think the far north is a classic example. We are an island. We live totally disconnected from the rest of the world. Let's make it, uh, you know, the far north, let's make it happen up here. The other thing is that craziness of, of our economy. You know, like we, we can't, we've got to separate the measurement system. You know, we can, you know, more crime is great for our growth statistics. Um, so th those sort of things are, are really going to be, um, you know, are, are crazy. And we need to start giving people the, the message of what the alternative are, is and actually take away some of the myths about what, what makes up our economy, you know, and, and do it in a way that we don't scare people off. Like, we've had some talks today about, you know, some of the major problems we've got facing our, our, our Earth and our planet. When we deliver the message, we've got to do it with the hope and the opportunities that come with it. So if we just talk about the problem, the problem, the problem, the disaster that's coming, we'll, we'll actually turn people off and shut, the, the, shut down new opportunities. So we have got to be uh, able to provide the alternative while, while we're presenting that. Do you want to do the next one? Oh, sorry, I'll do it. Sorry, what am I going to do? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, the other thing is, I suppose, be careful what we, we hope for. On the left-hand side is um, the Gold Coast. And it started off as a batch, you know, and, and people going there, local people going there for their holidays. And so most probably not a lot of local people live there anymore. They live in other parts of Queensland, but they, that's all been taken up and they've gone, they've moved on. And 
Um, so we have to be careful, and I think Di raised this before, we can't be dependent on tourism and massive in industry. It's actually live, the people that live here that make our local economy and, make it, and can make it prosperous. So, you know, the key is to get that right. I used Kaikoura over there because I was there 10 years ago at a conference and a speaker from the community was there, and they said that 10 years ago they went, we've gone from a depressed area to an area that's actually flourishing. And they actually got together as a community and said, how much more do we want? How far do we go before it goes from positive development to negative impact on our families and communities? Because they had a flourishing little town, they all had jobs, they had a lovely little cafes and restaurants and everything going well, but did they want to go to the left-hand side? And they decided they weren't. They were going to make it difficult through their planning process with council for more development, you know, limit the number of beds that could happen in Kaikoura. Interesting. We don't talk about that too much in New Zealand. Um, and I, I'll, I'll just zip through there, you know, the, the, what CBEC's about. You know, we've been, we've focused on, um, on those four things, local ownership, creating employment, redirecting spending. Those are the sort of mechanisms we've used to get to where we are with CBEC. And I suppose we've always tried to avoid competing with the private business. There's no point in us starting up a new enterprise in town and competing with a local enterprise. And so we, we've always looked to grow new things to the district rather or to our, and to our area rather than actually fight over what's already there. And some of the things that... Um, some of the things that uh, have come through that is that um, we have created a lot of joint ventures and um, activities like that. Our first joint venture was with a private company in Kaitaia. So our first joint venture was Pukipoto Quarries to run the landfill. So that was one of the first things we ever did to, to, grow, to get some growth in our organisation. We took a big risk took on running the landfill, built the new landfill, ran it for seven years, and now Pukipoto Quarries still runs that landfill. We don't, but they still run it. So we stepped out of it. It wasn't enough, not enough in there for, for two organisations, so we let them have that. But what I'm saying is, from there, Seabag has gone and had joint ventures in Waiheke Island, wa uh, um, wai yeah, wa Waiheke, Wanaka, now with Tarawa in this area, and our friends... Nahu and Debbie in Moriwa, you know, um, and we've grown from those joint ventures. Every time we did that, we did a big step up in, in activity. Um, and those are sort of things. Those are sort of things we do. Um, that's just an example of some of the things we do. And I suppose looking at each one of those slides, we do it. And the, the key word is unorthodox. You know, we've done everything differently. There's, there's, and a lot of it hasn't been planned, to be honest, too greatly. <laughs> we've just done things. Um, but like with the insulation, you know, when you're unorthodox, you, you, you look at a market that isn't, doesn't exist. We've targeted low-income families, not high-income families. The people that, that um, don't have the, the money is our target market. Um, on the right-hand side with our labour hire, we've just done everything we can possibly do to create jobs and we use our labour hire to do that, and we'll, and we'll also do jobs that normally someone would come out of town to do, like big landscaping projects. We do them in town. We create the, the jobs locally. On the right, the, the bottom here the, is our recycling crew. There's only not, not all of them. There's mostly about two-thirds of them. And again, we were told recycling would never work 25 years ago, 15 years ago, and as, as, as recent as 10 years ago, that what we were trying to achieve was not possible. Interesting statistic. In New Zealand, if we suddenly recycled the waste that's currently going to landfill, we would create 28,000 jobs in New Zealand, permanent jobs forever. There's already thousands of jobs within the recycling industry, but there's 2.8 million tonnes of waste still going to landfill. If we turn that into a, a resource, 28,000 permanent jobs. And we're looking about growing New Zealand's economy by bringing new industry. There's one right there in the, uh, without actually changing anything. So it's, I suppose it's... Um, and we have a bus service. Again, bus services... Rural communities don't have bus services because they don't work. Well, they do work. We're the most affordable bus service in New Zealand. We're the cheapest per kilometre driven. We um, are one of the highest performing bus service in the top five of the 15 public transport systems operating in New Zealand. And we run on biofuel, which is sustainable fuel, 50% of our fuel. So we actually can run pretty good bus services in, the, in rural communities. It's just we're not allowed to. We're the only one out of 15 uh, public transport systems that get no funding from government. Only one. 
but we're the highest performer. Unusual. Um, and so aware of time, moving on, are we, getting, are we being prepared for what's going to around the bend? There was a great program on Māori television just last week on peak oil. And we've been told about this a bit like the, the Lorax, you know, we, the, um, a guy Hubbard in 1952 was telling us it's going to run out in America in 70, 72, 73. It happened in 74. We all, some of us remember the crash in New Zealand or fuel prices in 74. Well, he predicted that and he also predicted the one in 2008. So, you know, like we've been told about this, we're just not reacting. Let's not wait for other people to actually get us there. Let's make the, do the preparation ourselves now because these things are going to have massive effects on small rural communities. You know, what, you know, fuel prices over the last 12 years has gone up 130%. Wages, 30%. I guarantee that trend line will happen again over the next 10 years. That case, we will not be driving to work. We will not be able to afford to. I can tell you that right now. So, if we don't make some pretty radical changes soon, we're going to pay the price. So, we need to develop our own models, not wait for any other models of economics. We de develop our own. And I suppose this is the interesting, exciting stuff. You know, like we're now getting it's about what we can do rather than you know like what the problem is. And we can do a lot in our in our retail sector. You know, I've often wondered about doing a measurement of all the product that comes into this town, Kaitaia. Like, let's measure how much bread, how much meat, how much milk, how much everything that comes into the site, and then work out out of that 50 different commodities what you can start a business around, what would sustain a local business. Because we can beat them all, we don't have to freight it up, and the freight price is going to be getting higher and higher. You know, like, we've got an example of our market where fruit prices are half the price of pack and save. I think we could do the same with a lot of these products. So let's get our local businesses flourishing. Um, and then there's just some madness, you know, like um, who in their right mind would actually do the top, would actually initiate the top, throwing all our resources into a landfill? You know, realistically, if you put a child down and gave them the options, what would they choose? So we, we've looked at opportunities, like turning that madness into opportunities, and recycling is one of the things we're known for, um, but, and it's now, you know, we're one of the, the, the far north, couldn't be done 25 years ago, like I say, and 15, and 10 years ago, what we said we were going to do couldn't be done by the experts. We're a leading organisation in New Zealand. We're one of the top performing recycling districts in New Zealand, and so it can be done. And it's most likely done a lot easier because we're not influenced by a big urban population that's hard to change. We're a small boat that can, can manoeuvre pretty, pretty rapidly. Um, infrastructure, uh, you know, like we're, sta we're in a building that, you know, there's a lot of agony in this, our community about building infrastructure. You know, building Te Ahu, it was the greatest thing we've ever done in a long time. Yeah, yeah. It really was important that we actually, we actually did something, you know. Infrastructure is for the people that live here and the people who might choose to come here. That's what we're building it for. Not for, for tourists, we're, we're building it for ourselves. And the same with things like aquatic centres. Let's just do them. Let's get them built and get on with it. So, because they will make our living here far nicer and it will attract people to the area rather than just be dependent on tourism. Um, other things, we don't like unnecessary spending. We, and one of the things that we are, we've started with was a home insulation, but we're moving into energy saving and energy generation. I won't take away Norman's talk, but he'll go into more detail about that. But it's just the madness. We're the highest, we, we pay the highest price for power in New Zealand, and we've got the best place to generate it by the sun. We might make it a connection there at some stage. Um, Anyway, I also think there's a massive opportunity for this district. This is just something I've thrown up, and don't worry about the wording. I think we have, we've, we're, the best, we're the best in New Zealand at recycling. We're, we're up there. We're going to be the best at energy efficiency. I can tell you that within five years we'll be leading New Zealand. So let's grab some high ground and rebrand ourselves, or not the only brand, but grab the brand of sustainability for this area and get people coming up here who want to come up here and live here for that reason and who want to visit us to see what we do. There's a real opportunity there for this district to go. There's a lot of positive things up here, not negative things. And I suppose employment. At the end of the day, we've got to get proactive about employment and that means creating jobs. This is not the jobs that exist. 
we have to create a, another circle of activity around our economy that is job creation. CBEC started doing that by just creating jobs, clearing riverways, building playgrounds. You know, every playground in this town is by built under an employment creation program. Time to go back there. We've got plenty of caring to do. We've got plenty of trees to plant. You walk out of this, in this place here and there will, in any direction, 100 metres, you'll find 100 jobs. There's no end to work. It's just connecting up unemployment spending with employment. You know, so let's just make that connection. Um, the other thing is, and I suppose finishing on this, un CBEC's unorthodox. And I looked it up in the... I was trying to find a word to describe us, and I think this does. You know, CBEC is unconventional, it's unusual, unwanted. We've been named or called all these things at some stage. Um, I like avant-garde. I always thought it was a different meaning for... I never really knew the, under, the, the description of avant-garde, but it really describes us. What does it say? I think it says something like... Um, got it here somewhere. Making the most of what you have... Um, no, sorry, 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 no... Anyway, avant-garde is basically being completely different and doing it in a different way. You know? And I thought, when I found that description, I thought, those are the things we need to do in this district. We need to be acting in this manner to bring the changes we need to. We need to be unorthodox. And, I, and that does describe CBEC. Very unorthodox. Thank you. For 15 years or so, I've been working here. Great to reconnect with Deb and Nahau again. Other people in the Hokianga, um, Dave and Janine, and uh, other people in the area. My whanau connection is through Takahiwai Marae. I feel very closely connected to the north, so I might be wearing a different hat this time, but I feel that I'm, uh, I'm back again to do the next, the mahi is important and needs to be done. Also mentioned, uh, Ruben, that some of your uh, activities have reached down as far as Wellington, some of your work in housing and sustainable housing. So um, you're beginning to make waves. Just returning to the We've lost. Thank you. Just give it a go. The themes of the conference empowering communities, putting the local back into our economy, and you cannot control what you do not own. So, how many people here in their backyard have got one of these? <laughs> of a scale of that kind? Okay. <laughs> I didn't realise that uh, we had the owners of Contact Energy here. Okay. How many people own any of these? Bit of a trick question because in fact you do own it and we'll talk about that later. Okay. How many people own one of those on the left hand side, a hot water cylinder? Here's the crunch. How many people own a hot water cylinder wrap? Okay. And which one of these most accurately reflects the shower in your house? Okay. The one on the top right hand home, hopefully. So what do these ten things all have in common? They all provide water. They all provide hot water to your home, or your business, your marae, your sports club, church, or so on. But let's go back and have a little bit of a test look at the humble hot water cylinder wrap. It saves you money, it saves you New Zealand dollars money by generating what we call in the trade negawatts, and a negawatt is the unit of electricity saved. So let's just have a look at some of the figures. <coughs> so here we have our humble hot water cylinder wrap.
it's still under wrap. This particular hot water cylinder wrap you could be said began its life in Moriwa in 2001 when Deb and Nahau, uh, with my support, set up what's become Healthy Homes Taitokarao. So if you imagine this hot water cylinder wrap has since 2001 been steadily chugging away and you imagine it's got another 10 or 15 years of its life. There's $2,000 there. You don't own the dam, with one or two exceptions, <laughs> but you do own a hot water cylinder wrap. Now let's just think about the implications of this and what it means, not only to the households, but to the broader economy. So we assume the wrap was installed in 2001. It's been chugging away for 13 years. You own it, you control it, and you realize the financial benefits of that investment. So let's just take a closer look and see how much it's cost you to be saving money. But first of all, a very quick aside. I'm, we'll run through this, um, not now, but um, for every dollar that you pay for your power bill, most of that money leaves the local economy. Of course, it goes to Contact Energy or Meridian or one of those companies. You'll see there a figure of 16 cents which suggests that uh, some of the money stays because Top Energy um, charge the electricity companies to transmit but most of the money leaves your economy. So the cylinder wrap costs about $120 to install, saves this amount of money. But the critical thing is the next bullet point there, that you're paying 35 cents or thereabouts for your electricity the cost of investing in a hot water cylinder wrap over the life of the wrap, you are s the electricity that you're saving is costing you one to two cents. So by taking control of your electricity bill, you are getting chunks of your electricity at between one and two cents rather than paying 35 cents. Is that a good deal for you? but wait, there's more. So this is just a humble hot water cylinder wrap. I must say the figures here surprised me a little, but they came from the Department of Building and Housing to suggest that a low flow, high performance hot water uh, cylinder, uh, a high performance shower head could save $500 a year. I guess you'd have to have about seven teenagers to be saving that sort of money. But these are the kinds of figures which are being moved around. So what we're starting to do, if you're beginning through the thousands of houses that have been retrofitted already, we are saving thousands of dollars, millions of dollars are being saved because they're being re retained within the local far north economy. These are average and general figures. The average New Zealand house spends that amount of money. In the far north, the average New Zealand house, as far as we can project without doing the serious research, is paying in the order on the average of $230 per month. There will be some exceptions here because some people really seriously engage with energy efficiency, but does anybody here pay three or four hundred dollars over winter for their power bill every month. Yeah. So the um, Ministry of Social Development each day get requests from several households whose power bills are in the order of three to five hundred dollars per month. So this is the money that's holding those households in poverty and 
it's exporting and sending the money to other parts of New Zealand. It's not being retained here. I'm not going to go into this in detail, excepting to point out the obvious that the less money you have, the more money you're spending on paying your power bills, or if you're not paying your power bills, then your children are getting sick, they're getting asthma, they're getting the kind of diseases associated with being in cold, damp and unhealthy houses. So what we're talking about, the vision that uh, Cliff has, and Cliff is incredibly ambitious and sometimes he scares people like me because of what he believes can be done, but with a 25-year track record of what CBEC has achieved, who am I to tell Cliff that he's being incredibly ambitious? But this is the kinds of targets that Cliff has talked about, saving up to 50% of the energy used in households and in businesses and in marae and in schools and in industry across the region. Capturing and retaining those dollars to rebuild and strengthen and support the Far North economy. And there's been some discussion around what's called economic multipliers. It's the number of times the money goes round and around. So a dollar saved in the economy. We had that very interesting example. I'm still trying to get my head around uh, the, the $100 bill and where it actually went. This is trying to actually uh, say that um, we think that, yeah, what, what Ken was saying was, was true, but maybe it didn't work quite in the, quite in the dramatic way that you, that you pointed it out to us. But in summary, different amounts, different economic activity has different economic multiplier benefits. And this is just a summary, it's a quick way of saying that for every dollar saved in the local economy, the money does go around not in the way that quite that you described it can, but it does actually go round and round and have a valuable multiplier benefit. So that's the figure that uh, Cliff has set. And I believe it's possible. Now, you're, you're aiming high, Cliff, and that's what you've always done, and that's why you've got what you've achieved. So just very quickly, um, energy dollars, save goes into local pockets. Um, the money doesn't leave town. Some of it stays here. But of course, the other good news for you very smart people in the far north is when about 15 years ago, the energy sector was restructured, people here had the good sense to retain the ownership of your local lines company. So you each get a discount per year and all the other profits go back into community groups and community activities. And they also support energy efficiency programs as well. So um, to those of you who fought a campaign to retain local control of your local lines company, I applaud you. You did really well. Us folks in Wellington have seen ours go offshore on its own, I think, by a Singaporean infrastructure company. So Cliff talked about energy projects that I'm working with CBEC to help roll out, and um, here are two of them. The rolling out of a photovoltaics uh, supply and installation services underway, Many people here I know have already gone off grid. How many people have got PV here already? Yeah. That's a greater percentage than almost any other part of the country. But I think they ain't seen nothing yet once we get some serious market, market penetration. And the other activity which is uh, coming close is the local assembly and manufacture of a very high efficiency wood burner. And there's several other ideas that um, uh, Cliff and I are talking about with Paul Hansen and others and um, the creation of a collective electricity buying group, development of whole of house energy packages, support services for industry and business. 
And bullet point four is something which has already been commenced, and that's the creation of a, of a coalition across the region, not just bottom-up with communities, but top-down working with them. Um, Wayne Hutchison is here today from Northland Inc., who's the energy, who's the economic development agency for the region. North Energy, Paul Warsfeld was here yesterday, he's not here today. We're beginning to work with Top Energy on a project that will see them involved with energy efficiency. So we're looking to create a broad-based coalition of the willing. And of course we still want to with Deb and Nahau, who are CBEC's critical partners in this energy project. Um, and they've been working together so far on the one energy activity, the retrofit work, um, uh, is to keep going with the energy retrofit work because among other things, that attracts decent chunks of government money from outside the region. And uh, just a very quick example, um, Gussing, a small town in Austria, on the ropes or on the barbed wire as it were, has literally rebuilt its economy through a combination of energy efficiency, utilising its own indigenous materials. Uh, here in, uh, in the far north, it might be woody biomass, and of course you've got the, the NAFA um, uh, geothermal steam as well. And how do we do this in the far north? Well, as we speak right now, Paul Hansen, who is uh, uh, CBEC's energy man, is at a conference in Australia where the first ever community power conference. So entities such as CBEC and Hayiwi and many others from around Australia are um, putting together a concerted initiative, so it looks like that maybe the far north is going to be one of the first New Zealand entities to join what might be an Australasian initiative. Okay, so winding up. It's underway. It's happening. It's building on work that's been done to date. Uh, Kina, as uh, Cliff has mentioned, has put resources in terms of my time in to try and help incubate some of these, uh, these new initiatives uh, over the sort of period that uh, Shrana extended. So that's uh, currently being explored and investigated. Um, so it's a broad-based strategy. It's building on what's been achieved. It's plugging the leaks. It's generating megawatts, and it's uh, using local resources to rebuild and give you the economy. Kia ora whare, tu ana hau ki te mihi a te kao koe, te hau kainga, te hoa e te rangatira, me heki te kaupapa o tēnei hui, mihi atu, mihi atu, mihi atu. Mihi atu ki a koutou ngā tangata kato, o ngā hau e whae hara mai nei, ki te tautoko o te kaupapa oranga o te tangata, o te whenua, o te ao katoa, ngā mihi, ngā mihi, ngā mihi. Well, whānau, you Philip has been sitting there for a long time. You know, my background is from being a youth worker. That's where I come, that's where my roots are. So you've got to all stand, because you fellas are going to get tired, and I'm sure your brains are a bit soaked, so etu. Now, now, see, I did this with rangatahi, and they were really onto it. Now, they say as you get older, the brain starts to get a bit ngenge which means a bit tired. So I want to see if this is true. This is a very simple exercise in seeing how quick your reflexes are. So what I'm going to do is simply, as my hand crosses, when it crosses, you clap. If it doesn't cross, you don't clap. Now, do you want me to explain that again, just for some? Okay. <laughs> All right, let's do it. Now, when my hand crosses... For those that can't see, I'll put it up here. You clap when they cross and you don't clap when they don't cross. Okay? Ready? Oh, well. It was, it was a bit slow. Come on, guys. It was like, you know what do they call it? Lagging. Okay, there we go. Woo, pretty good. Okay. Oh. Watching. Come on, concentration. It's still early in the morning. And we got somebody from the council couldn't get it. I'm in trouble. We're in trouble. We're in trouble. <laughs> yeah, give that money back. 
<laughs> yeah, you got excited about that money, eh? Okay, let's do it. Oh, come on, we gotta get it right. You're gonna be on. Nah, I'm not gonna do that. Okay, one more time, one more time. Come on, let's go. Oh, thank you very much, people. Just in case I say bad things and you're not gonna clap after. You know, one of the whakatoakis or one of the sayings uh, behind, uh, at the beginning of my mahi in my hometown of Moirua, where I was born and bred, was this whakatoaki that we used to use, tamatū, tamaora, tamanoho, tamamate. To stand is to live, to lie down is to die. And that's been a sort of a catch cry over the many years that we've been there, me and my wife, over close to 25 years now. So when you start to talk about doing things, it just doesn't happen overnight. And one of the things, you know, I was thinking, a wise person says to me, a very wise person said to me, if you don't look within, you go without. If you don't look within, you go without. Now, a lot of the corridor that I've heard, and I've got to apologize, I got here late yesterday. Because see, if we don't do this right, the other mahi I do, which is stopping people go to jail, gets prolific. Uh, I, it, so it sounds funny, but it's actually true. That if we don't get our shit together, we're going to perpetuate what's been happening. And we've heard, I'm not going to go over the story again about this region, this region, you know, we're defined many times by everybody else. Actually, Māori are used to that, you know, being defined by everybody else. And if we're going to change things, now this is not a put down. When I talk about this, this is around partnership, true partnership. And I want to take my hat off to my mate over there, Cliff. Because he stayed in the room with this porangi Māori when we sat down and negotiated about how we do business and I brought my kaupapa onto the floor, which comes from a whole different lens. And he sat down there and we worked it through. See, because I think sometimes we got to ask, we can, you know, he's shown all the stuff that has happened. And that's just generated by two groups. Look at this room. Oh, the other thing too is that I haven't bought a PowerPoint. That's why I bought the white, the white shirt, just in case you get bored. <laughs> also made, I think, from Rawane, this one, this shirt. But, you know, I'll tell you a story, because I'm a storyteller. And uh, when I was a young fella, uh, I, we, I used to go to Mordor school. And, you know, back in the day, you only had one TV channel. And we know that we heard that the television New Zealand was coming to Mordor. So, wow, you know, that's... And they were coming to our school because my dad was chairman of the school board. So, you know, they came in with their cameras. So we all rushed home. Mordor was going to be on TV. woo -hoo. So just as we were watching the news, you see this pan shot. And it was my funny. And just as they were doing that, they made this comment that these people from lower socioeconomic and they were poor. Well, what's the first time I realized I was poor? <laughs> See, people who define us, or if we start to believe the rhetoric, or we believe the lie, you know, you hear a lie long enough. See, we talk about being poor. Actually, my wife says, don't talk about poverty, talk about greed. Yeah, very simple. And actually, I heard a bit of that yesterday. But I don't want to get stuck there. I don't want to get stuck there. And I like my bro over there. You know, I love it, bro. You know, because together, in partnership, and that's what we've got to see, what we have, not what we don't have, or be defined by others outside of this area. Because the real power for change is in here. Or when you talk about pohara or poverty, the poverty is that I don't have. The poverty is that our mind 
He shut down. So, who oh, sounds evangelistic? <laughs> so one of the one of the things I have to talk about, and that's what I felt. We're going through this thing, this whole region, because I'm talking about a region. You know that. We think we can't, but we're hearing snippets. We're all divided into our own little pockets. Because you've got to ask. You know, I, I, another thing, I, I went to another trip to Australia, and I think people have heard this, so you can hear it again. Sorry. <laughs> but, you know, I learn because I'm open to opportunity. You know, Atua created us to be creative. So you've got to keep all senses open. So I go to Australia to see my sister-in-law, you know, and I travel up to Cairns, you know, going up to Cairns, and you see these signs, you know, oh, I want to go for a swim, beware of the crocodiles. <laughs> you go up to the campsite, you know, have a look inside there, beware of the mosquitoes, dinghy fever. I look at some of the places and, oh, it's just mangrove. You know, you go to the, you know, the beach in Cairns, they put sand down. And it's all mangrove. You know, I take my hat off to those people. Because even though they've got snakes, spiders, dinghy fever, you know, swamp, they've created an existence out of there. Amazing. We come from the north. No snakes. No dinghy fever. Beautiful beaches. Amazing climate. And we're poor hunter. <laughs> There's something wrong with this picture. And, you know, because you're that saying, hey, if you always do what you've always done, you always get what you always got. So we need to change the picture. Ah. So with all of this, you've got to ask the question, so why are we stuck why are we in this place? And that's something that, you know, we heard some of it yesterday. I've got to acknowledge my whanau. They sat up and spoke, and we heard it. It was uncomfortable. Ooh, those Marys up there doing their thing again. How come they're always complaining? How come they always got the negative? Why are they doing that? Can't they see what we're doing? It's good for all of us. Actually, no, it isn't. That's why they're complaining. See, I've got to say this, and I'm not doing this to takahi any other culture in the room or to put down. The truth is that in this region, the development has been about one culture and their aims. And they've been empowered to do that. I'm telling you, you are missing out. In the economic crisis that we're in at the moment, you need us Maoris. I'm telling you, that is not a joke. And what we bring, hear me, and I'm saying to you Maoris, we need our Pākehā friends too, so don't get too cocky. Yeah. And uh, you saw an example. You saw an example when the collaboration comes together. You know, Thursday, we're opening a curtain bank in Moirua, the metropolis of Moirua. <laughs> of course, I had people that, like you, you know, oh, no, you can't do that in Moirua. Why? So, our, now, I'm not putting down the attempts to try and create opportunity, but usually the job is we're usually working in the menial stuff, and we're just making it, some not. We need to share this. We need to share the prosperity. And we're not talking about pingers or money. You know, we need to share the resources. My thing to the council, this is very simple, very simple thinking. The chain is as strong as its weakest link. So when we talk about regional development, we need to be looking at those areas that are struggling. Because if you don't pay any attention, you're going to get bitten in the ass. And it's simply because if our people aren't engaged, if our people aren't part of the solution, NAFA is a beckoning. 
You know, for us, one of my things with my, with my colleague, she says, when we go into Ngafa to see our Fanonga, she says, oh, man, boys, us come out to a queer out here multitasking because you're in, on the marae because you're in this marae. People, all I've come really to say, and I could talk about the, the, the work of Moirua, but they actually there's better ones there they can talk about because they're doing it too. I only represent some amazing people given the opportunity to get into the sunlight and create and co-create. You know, we're talking about, we bought a factory the other day because we're going to build those stoves, those ovens. You know? We were talking the other day with North Power about how we're going to help hook up the fiber optic cable using our guys. See, I think, talk about energy, there's another energy. And I'm going to put that there. For us, Māori wairua is really important. It's not an airy-fairy thing. We started this kaupapa this morning with our, matu, with our, with our haukainga, you know, lifting, hicking our combined energy to atua. And I don't apologise for that thinking if it's upsetting to people. Because for me, coming down that line, and this is coming back, to how we do this. It's around values. You know, enterprises with a heart. Enterprises that are driven from people, not profit of money. <laughs> you know, if I was to do the corridor around my, my um, I was thinking when I was sitting there, uh, the uh, PowerPoint, I would flick the camera around and put it on you. See, because here's the potential. Yeah? Here's the kākano or the seeds of opportunity and future. So if you're looking for somebody to ride in, and, uh, and I love our speaker from, uh, uh, <laughs> thank you, Shona. And it is good sometimes to look without, because sometimes you can't see the wood from the trees when you're stuck in doing it hard. And there are times we need to go out. You know the story I saw, he told the story of Kaikoura. You know, if any, you know, you've heard the story, but it's true. You know, they were, their town was dying. These tourists turned up by accident, thought there was something really happening. And the town was going, oh, what are we going to do? Our young people are leaving. It's really bad. You know, and these people at the back, the tourists says, yeah, but you got whales. The rest is history. So what have we got? What aren't we seeing? Now, I can tell you, the rarirauru from our people is that you don't see us. I'm telling you, you say the words, and I'm talking to our partners here, you don't see what we bring. And I understand that. I understand that because you come from a construct of a world that's created around your thinking and around your lens. So you don't understand that. But what I'm saying to you today, for the future of this region, the future of this nation, is that you need to open your eyes and see what you have. It is people, it is people, it is people. It is people. And all you see with all my relations in Moroa is just, you know, they're, 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 they're growing. They're starting to take their power back, their mana back, because they ain't going to be walking to somebody else's narrative or construct. I think that island that you talked about over in Scotland is my little community. But you come from communities, little, big so what part, what part, what value do you play in there? And it's got to be shared. It's not about quo, myself. It's got to be about tato kato for all of us. And when, so the kororo is that he kai o te rangatira. And I know time is going. Five, five minutes. Te kai o te rangatira. See, this is where I love our kororo. It is about, you know, he aha te kai o te rangatira. What is the food of chiefs? He called it all. 
Now, just because you have a meeting doesn't mean it's a kayote rangatira. Unless it's about the katu. It is about others. It's about the bigger picture. It's about the bigger picture. Usually when I'm doing this, I get nervous. What are they thinking? What are they thinking? But I want to take my time because it's really important. You know, I came here just like, um, you know, what I really wanted to come for, it wasn't to, to court it all. Actually, I came to listen. I came to hear what's happening in this region. That's what I came for. Where are the possibilities? Where are the synergies? Where are the things? See, the kororo, why I say that is, I know what I know. But there's many things I don't know. See, too many times, we're not listening. Because all we are about is what we know. But we've got huge gaps. There's heaps we don't know. So it's not building on. So me talking, I'm telling you what I know. But the element for me is that I need to know what I don't know. That's why we need everybody in the room. And you know, and I'm not into the patronizing. I, you know, there's this corridor. And um, my niece, she's sort of... Uh, become, uh, I think, child psychologist, and she did her thesis. And one of the kororo in there, she talks about, uh, and, I, and I don't mean to offend, and it's called the noble savage. And the process, behind, the thinking behind this, that yes, we are noble, but one day, you know, we're noble, but we're still savages, and one day we'll get it. We haven't got it, people. Figure it out. But what I'm saying is, we, you need to hear the voices. You need to see what we have. You know, I, I, you hear Cliff over there? We're like that at Morwa. We're just obsessed with the opportunities. You know, you would think if we talk, where are those fellows from? It can't be from up north because there's nothing happening up there. I agree with Norman Smith. Actually, we have catalysts here that nowhere else in the country, Māori will talk out from a point of tonga tuku iho. Those are things, gifts given to us by Atua for us to maintain, and I come back to that. People say, well, you must be a greenie now, I'm a Māori. And part of me being a Māori is that I'm a kaitiaki. You know, part of my job is that I'm a steward of this tonga that we have. Because it has given life to us, so we have to maintain it. That's what we bring to the table. That's what we bring to the table. So, people, you know, the excitement is when I get into a room full of people, I think, gee, let's, let's multiply this. You know, I'm not a number cruncher like these guys over here, right? But I know what two, this hoop and nose kid from Moro has been able to be a part of. You know, and be infectious, you know, about the possibilities. Because that's what Cliff is. You sit in the room and, you know, man just does your head in. So I just want to finish here, and I thank you again for the opportunity. And I just want to encourage you in this room that you are part of the solution. But we need to be aware of not only first who we are, but who sits in the room. And the power that we have to do this in a collective way. So, whānau nō reira kumi oro i taku koro i tēnei ātua, mā te atu e manaki. Kia ora. Yeah, I have a very simple question, Mr. Smith. How much is a cylinder wrap thing to me? Buy and installed by people like Sidbeck or Hayeli about $120 and savings in the order of $80 a year. Thank you. I hear what you're saying, and that's not a problem, except you're talking with people that live from hand to mouth. And $120 at that 
point in time is a lot of money. You cannot see the $2,000 down the track that you will save. And I agree with you totally. However, you are talking a lot to people who are very poor, basically. And you, to do that, you need to be able to say, hey, how do we change our thinking? We're fighting for space here now. Kia um, you know, People realise that a lot of our family, you know, they're all not on the same level. So that was part of the initiative from the government for warming up. Uh, New Zealand was part of it. So they put peer, uh, put in for a lot of our whānau who had the low end to get their houses done for free. That's part of that job was the cylinder apps. Um, the major issue around there was actually the health side for our whānaus, because in Māori whānaus there are a lot of young children, kaumātua queer. So in regard to that quarter or about the cost of it, for those that have given, and that's where um, both Cliff and I and, and our team have been able to get into every single house, uh, um, you know, getting the message out there that this thing at this time, the government sees as a priority to make sure that they at least get that uh, intervention. Uh, also, there's, there's something else which, uh, which we've been discussing, and that is, you're quite right, sometimes if you're looking to the choice between food and a hot water cylinder rack, it's no contest. However, there's other ways to do this, and we've been exploring as part of this suite of activities the idea of um, a revolving loan fund. Uh, so if there's several thousands of dollars, if you loan to the household the $120, or you supply and install the rack for nothing, then the savings generated will repay the cost of the loan. So very often, energy efficiency measures will pay for themselves, providing you can put in place some kind of financial instrument, I think is the flash term, some kind of revolving fund or something to get people over uh, what Rob probably points out as one of the initial barriers. Uh, just following up that, um, just interestingly, I'll, we've been talking about it, setting up a, a, a revolving loan fund talked about and um, thinking that maybe our organisation could put 20 or 25 thousand dollars into a fund that we get our money back it might be seven or five years whatever but we get the money back at some stage so and that would go into revolving loan fund at sort of one or two percent just covering administration costs to make it really possible for people on friday the late the guy that runs our accounts at work came up to me and said how far are we going with this loan fund i didn't even know about and we're, we're already set, we're already loaning to people who can't afford it um, and getting them into new systems. And so we set a figure of $30,000 as, as far as we can go at CBEC with already doing this. And I didn't even know what was happening. It was just people within the organisation picking up on, a, on some need and small amounts, like $1,000 here and $2,000 there for their systems, was already going out at three to six months, no interest to help people get going. So. I think the, there's a massive opportunity for setting up, like we're already putting some money into a loan fund, we might as well formalise it and say it's a loan fund maybe administered by somebody else external to us. And anyone can put their $1 to $1,000 to $100,000 into that, knowing that that will generate an absolute change in someone's, somebody's life, in some family's life in, in this area. I think it would be very attractive to a lot of people who look at the North and say, what can we do for the North? Oh, we've got a lot of spare money, we'll put $5,000 or $10,000 over two or three years, knowing we'll go for home insulation, home heating and home health. And so I think that's unofficially already happened, I didn't even know it was happening. Um, and uh, I think it's just a matter of formalising. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. You know that you're just the figurehead of your organisation. Just looking at, at um, what, what you're looking at doing, Cliff, and, and, all, and what Sean was talking about, the Blueskin Bay um, Energy Project is one that I'm quite interested in because um, I think uh, I'm thinking about you know smaller communities and again what Robert was saying about people not having much money. The people with the least money pay the highest power bills because people like me can afford to do things like photovoltaic cells and so on. I would really like to see my community be able to do that as a community project. So are you looking at going in that direction? Well, I think there's a, uh, a absolutely can 
split and there's a big pocket of money. The thing is, the money's already been spent in a lot of cases, like there was, uh, someone pointed out before Norman did that, every one of our wins offices in the far north is right now paying out a lot of money to pay powers for people yeah. who just can't afford it. So the money's going there, but it just keeps going up, and that money doesn't stick to town, keeps going out of town. Yeah. So if you transfer some of that spend into helping get that, that appliance mm -hmm. that's going to create heat and, and hot water into the house, you're going to improve the health of the house, efficiency, productivity, all those things come with it. And so the money, some of the money is already happening, you know, coming in and going straight back out again. So it's about bringing some of those things together. You know, I can see a, the ideal program might be that low-income families want to do this with their homes. They might get a grant of $1,500 from someone like uh, MSD. They get maybe a philanthropy or organisation puts in a $1,000 per household and they borrow the rest and it's from low interest and suddenly they can do it. Like Norman said, the, the efficiency <coughs> pays for the cost of, of this anyway. Yeah. It just makes it quicker and more possible. Wealthy people, people with some money and resources will do it anyway and get the benefit straight away. Um, people on low income won't get close. No. And so this the, is the way the that reason I mentioned Western Bay because Shona raised it and I believe they've done it as a community. Is that right? I can just speak about that because yeah. I'm actually acting as an advisor to the political Bay as well, also yeah. wearing my, my uh, Kenyan hat. And, and I've got a whole range of programs yeah. going. Uh, um, but was your question about, about the funding instruments that they're using? Yeah. Oh, well, they'll be borrowing money, um, and political Bay can be putting in some money. They're going to need third party funding. In, in general terms, they're looking to raise about one and a half million dollars. Locally, but they'll need six or seven million dollars, so they'll be going for third party funding. Now, whether they try and raise that within Dunedin City or within their larger community, that's still to be determined. Thank you. Uh, Laurie, did you have a question? No, I'm just thinking Okay, thank you. Could the microphone be given to John, please? Thank you. Uh, I'm not quite sure who on the panel I should direct this to, but um, is there any way of tapping into existing landfills to extract methane to build a power plant and to, to, to uh, supply the local community? Thank you. I guess that's me. Um, there is, um, but normally you, re you require quite a substantial landfill and you need to have done it at the initial establishment stage to actually burrow into the system and get a good um, amount of gas out of a landfill without um, having the piping system in right from day one is not really that viable. And our landfills are relatively small, um, so the, and let's face it, we're, we're trying to discourage um, green matter going into our landfills because that causes the methane. Let's, let's not try and make a, a low efficiency gas system work just by putting in the wrong thing in the ground. You know, like we, we're trying to work the other way around. So really, landfills should have no gas in them because the stuff that's in there should be inert. And so what I'm saying is um, our ones in the barn are too small to justify. Uh, yes, thanks. That's, that's why I asked whether it was possible to actually tap into existing landfills because there's a lot of methane possibility there. But I, I get your point, Kurt. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm sure you could burrow into a landfill and you'd be cooking your fried eggs on top without too much trouble. Because there is a lot of gas in there, but the actual system of doing it economically would be um, difficult. Right, thank you. Okay, we were talking about. Uh, the energy efficiency and, and the wraps, but my mind immediately went to uh, people I know. I'm a counselor, and I get people in my rooms who are renting. I, mean, I had a young mother who moved something like 15 times in a single year, and these, you know, this was a woman with children. Uh, how do we, how do we do something about the rental situation in terms of? Um, the energy efficiency. I mean, uh, there's houses that aren't insulated. There's there's no wraps and cylinders. So they're going to have huge power bills. The landlord's not paying the power bill. Uh, so I'm just putting that out. Yeah, the issue is often known as called split incentives. 
So the tenant pays the bill, but the landlord pays the capital cost to improve the efficiency of the house. But the landlord has no incentive, so you're quite right. The government, through ECA, uh, perhaps Nahau can speak on this, the government has put in place incentives, which mean that landlords get quite significant subsidies uh, to upgrade their houses with certain preconditions, such as you agree really not to try and claw back what it has cost you in increased rents immediately. Um, but take up is very difficult because most New Zealand landlords are pretty cash strapped in their own right, not counting institutional landlords that own 35 <coughs> properties. Most of the average New Zealand landlord owns one or perhaps two properties. They're very cash, uh, cash constricted. And if something goes wrong in their house, they're the one that goes and fixes that drain. They don't bring in a, a contractor. So the government has to have great trouble in trying to address what you quite rightly point out. It's a major area of need for the private landlord. Public landlords, as in councils and particularly housing in New Zealand, have been steadily moving through the country from in the carbon to the far north. Right round their houses. I don't know if you've had any experience in working with private landlords, uh, Yeah, uh, um, one of the things that uh, yeah, I was just thinking, as you, as you said, the question was, you know, we have that all the time about being able to get people into uh, houses that actually just uh, are, are warm and healthy for their children. Uh, one of the things that, you know, I've got to say, we have a huge problem. And I, maybe adding to the issue really is around the whole thing of speculation with people. That's why they get here. And that's why they can't do that. But one of the things that Cliff was just mentioning to me, the thinking, there is the subsidies here for those that will take that up. The other thing they're talking about is uh, about a moral fitness for houses across the board. So that there's some basic things that are around meeting, you know, that every house should have you know, in regard to providing warmth shelter which is just you know, more than what we have, just a standard of code, and that's what they're looking at at the moment. I mean, we've even got people that are trained now to actually start looking at the efficiency of the house around a lot of those energy things, making suggestions and putting them into the places where you can get free services, talking with the landlords. And so the organization uh, that we're part of, you know, realizes a lot of those issues, and so we're trying to meet the need and create the, 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 the dialogue all the levels to try and, and it's not going to be one thing, I think. It's a range of options that, that we can offer to landlords. Um, the, the thing about one of the speculation stuff that, that had gone on and it's been busted and that's why people are strapped at the moment, well, I don't know how we're going to handle that one. And I'm not saying everybody that has property uh, is that way they're trying to keep good houses, but that's, an, you know, that's another dialogue. Thank you. Now, gentlemen with the microphone here on the aisle. Yeah, good morning. Um, just in regards to the uh, the uh, heating system uh, on moment, I think you mentioned it earlier. And uh, I was just going to put in the, uh, what the, um, like, uh, uh, up and close to the depth, like your covering we have there um, on the heater system. And uh, what the alternative with the solar panel? You know, with a heating system, and that would require some uh, heating. And of course, in terms of a cost factor, it's uh, by using our natural resources, the sun. And uh, uh, so I was concerned, I just to see what you think of it. Thank you. Could the uh, microphone be given to Jane at the back, please? Uh, yeah, I think the question is about the options, you know, how you establish what you need to do and how you do it. So I think there's a question, yeah. And I think the key thing is that um, we are now doing photovoltaic, you know, like so we at CBEC and PE, we are doing photovoltaic installations and we do at home installation and we hopefully will be selling downdraft woodburn as soon as the homes. But the, the key thing is we don't sell anything that people don't need it. There's a whole lot of things you can do in a house before you add anything new to a house to save energy. And I think the, the key is we would rather undersell the products than oversell the products. And at the moment, there's a lot of people talking about PV. It's like a, the whole world's decided that PV is going to be the, the, safe, you know, the, the big market, the, the next business for New Zealand. 
Um, and they're all selling big systems. Very good systems. And, you don't, and that doesn't work in this country. You've got to have systems that you have the smaller system that gives you the maximum outcome. So for whatever you need in a home, you've got to get the right advice in, the, in, in total, not just individual parts of the, of the, of the puzzle. So the key is, and that's, we do give people advice on that, we'll go into your home and actually look at your home and go, okay, what are all the things you can do now without anything new, no extra cost, just changing everyone's habits, and then you go to start looking and adding the things that actually will improve your, you know, the money that you save in your home and the heating system and stuff like that. So get the right advice first, and um, there's a lot of snake oils and oil salesmen out there right now selling big systems that are really not going to work for you. Uh, yeah, just actually picking up, uh, um, sorry, I picked up a question earlier. Um, what we, um, I put up on the screen, and briefly in passing, what we call a whole of house uh, upgrade. And that, as Cliff suggests, you go in and you do a comprehensive energy audit, whether it's weatherizing, cylinder apps, shower heads, uh, heating systems, photovoltaics, heat transfer system, double glazing. And you, can't, and you have a, a thoughtful conversation with the family as well that relates not just to the, to the, the status of the uh, performance of the building, but you look at the family and the whānau and the health. And, and you know, if you've got that, um, got that motto that comes to visit and, and they get asthma, well, that changes your whole priority about what you do to different parts of the house. But in summary, you finish up with a big list of 15 or 20 possibilities and you work them through in order of health priorities and financial benefits and you just work through. And I think what you're suggesting is sometimes that's really confusing to know what to do first. And if someone comes in um, and they're selling a photovoltaic system or a heating system or a hot water system or double glazing, surprise, surprise, what are they going to suggest is the first thing you need to do? The product they've got for sale. So what Nahau and Cliff are looking to offer at a greater level yet again, that's an input from me, is a whole of house package solution that takes the bias out of the solution in the products. And I think this, <coughs> that's the next, the next real plus. Uh, oh, I had deja vu. Now I stole my speech. That's exactly what I said yesterday. <laughs> exactly this presentation he gave, I gave yesterday. It was a bit pleasure. But he didn't have his wife telling him to do it properly. <laughs> Which, by the way, we can do. Dave knows everything, everything about that industry. Um, uh, I like this meeting so far, everybody. It's going great. The great thing I like about the pressure and poverty is that it gets everybody to sort their crap out. And we can start concentrating on real problems. Not crap problems about who's winning the World Cup, but problems about our fixing our children's issues. And so for me, I'm like them, exactly like now. My background is in whenua, gardens, working the land. But well, we've had to be involved in this industry because of the housing, uh, the, the, the problems around the housing is just killing our people. And so this particular panel it's so important for us to take this opportunity right now and take this whole summit and use it as an opportunity right now to make a real commitment, take the uh, inspiration from Cliff and be like him and fly like the eagles. And let's make a real commitment now on the summit. I say we need to raise some serious equity, some real serious cash, and put it into this particular problem. You're not going to fix anything economic if our kids are stuck in hospitals and all we do is running backwards and forwards to Starship Hospital. You can't get, you can't grab the attention of the father and the young people out there if all they're doing is going backwards and forwards with all of these third world diseases distracting them from trying to find prosperity, trying to be here in a conference like this. So I'd like to take this opportunity and put a question not only to the panel, but to everybody in here, saying, let's dig deep. 
Let's find some serious equity to put into these ideas. I'm talking in the billions. If, it, if a summit like this made a commitment with the council, with the iwi, with Farnham and Hapu especially, we need Farnham and Hapu on this kaupapa. Without them, it's pointless. Then we're just feeding more corporates. We must get our Farnham and Hapu to get into this and say, we're going to make a huge commitment. We're going to go find a massive investment. Find somebody out there, let's go find Tim.com. I can give them a call. <laughs> and say, mate, we need that money. And we need it to kickstart this great new future that Cliff has been trying to get us to propose. So give us that money, we'll pay you back. There's a hundred of us in here right now who'll commit to it, plus another few thousand of my farmer. We'll commit to paying that back, but let's solve this issue. We've got an opportunity right now, today, to solve these problems that we're here to discuss. Can I respond to my 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 cousin, uh, my friend, is Guru, uh, Patrick Guru. I don't know if he is. You know, the Guru for me, Rube, is that actually we don't have to go and look without. My Guru is that the power sits in the room here. We don't have to go outside to actually create the resource, because the resource comes not just with Putia. You know, one of the biggest things that I've found uh, working alongside Cliff and in the mahi that I've done, and actually we should know it as mahi, in fact, for another thing, is our connections. As I said, Puti is only a tool. The connections that we have and people that we do know, and that is where your real powerhouse is. And I think I wouldn't mind having the dialogue around sitting around with people who have issues that they think that they want to be involved in and doing that is through the collective power of the people who see the issue and actually have a, a, a desire to work in that, that's how we're going to do it. Putia comes later, that's a natural flow on if you've got stuff that's sensible, makes sense and sustainable. But that first has to come from you know, the corridor, you know, kind of economy, and having everybody in the room, and not to be mataku. When I say mataku, is that thinking fearfully, oh, what do these people need to do? See, the, 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 the core of the driving force is that we want healthier homes for our whanau, for our mokopuna, for all of us. We want systems that actually aren't costing the earth and actually by uh, you know, overuse of wrong fuels. We can do this if we sit in the room long enough. We can work this stuff out. And I believe that, Brad, because you've got part of the answer. Uh, a singular, a big deal fight. You and your mate have part of that. If you bring that collective vision together, uh, as has uh, been said, Cliff, people around the world want to know. Uh, that's just, just my call to you, Brad. Okay. Right, uh, just yeah, two things. First of all, uh, thinking about the mob, I don't forget about the other one. Elders, because. Um, colder it gets, the more they die. And there's a very clear line within health department statistics that says when the temperatures go down, if you're older, you know, you, and you're not in a healthy home, you die. So they, they can link mortality with temperatures. Older people die more because they're in unhealthy <coughs> homes. And my comment to the people at the council here, we're talking about money and the role of funds and so on. Um, this is, I guess, to just worship the mayor Guy and John, I believe you have already debated a model which is being used by other councils, and that is when people get some government funding, get some sponsorship, but they're still a few thousand dollars short, and they own their own home in a number of centres, including Auckland and Wellington. The council has a loan facility. They will lend you money against your rates to cover that three or four thousand dollars short. It's called a targeted loan or a targeted rate. And um, I believe that the council here has considered but has not yet approved it in the far north. Can anybody correct me on the fact that you might be just lagging a little behind here? I can actually answer that question for you, Norm. Um, it's the regional councils that look after that rate, it's not the territorial authority because of the mandate around energy efficiency. 
that's actually not why I've got the microphone. I'm going to jump back to um, you yeah. speakers about some of the questions to do with that landlord and relationships, first of all. Um, one of the things is actually making the business case for pushing the money button for the landlord, and it's actually really easy to do that because happy tenants make stable tenants, um, but most landlords don't necessarily have that relationship with their tenants. To ask the questions that Norm talked about with how people are living in their home and operating the household, um, and so there's almost a, a gap or a role there for somebody to do the kind of work that Norm was talking about. Because it's, no, it's not just about the build in the house, it's about how people live in and drive that house once they're in there, about what um, maximises the benefits for them of the different initiatives. Um, and government has looked at this, and I actually did a lot of research on sustainable households and provided advice to the MFE at one stage around that um, brokering of how people are driving their homes to, to improve efficiencies and maximise the benefit. But for landlords, there's all the transaction costs and advertising, spring cleaning, breakages, potential emptying, um, empty space and all the rest of it. And it's very little to actually demonstrate to them that there are benefits in providing these, um, whether it's just uh, you know blocking drafts or whatever in curtains, as well as the insulation and wraps and everything else. Okay. Um, Could we I, start to summarise, I'm, please, Jane? I'm actually going to take my employee hat off now and put my citizen hat on because there is a question here that I wanted to put to the entire panel based on the presentations already. Um, I'm part of a community that is very uh, different in terms of it's got a real eclectic mix, multi uh, intergenerational, multicultural. Um, lots of different religious uh, backgrounds, different nationalities um, and all the rest of it, different motivations, very different reasons for occupying and living in that place. And for the last three months we've been talking about getting a community centre established and one of the things that's come up is about where can we locate? Do we need a physical space to initiate this work or can we actually start doing it from our living rooms? So my question to the panel, the first one is, do you think it's actually important to have, when you've started your social enterprises, to have a physical space? And does it have to be a community space, or do we go out and buy something uh, and become private property owners and have to man manage a premise as a start-up? Can we ha is there a community facility uh, model the best way to do it? It's question number one. The next one is, how do you feel about propriety? Once social enterprises started up in a community, does it mean that nobody else can start up an alternative social enterprise in that community? Does any one group get to own the space of being the social enterprise provider for that community? Or is it okay to have other people coming in and doing complementary things? To the second question, because can, can I say our learning, especially around other people sharing the space, actually it's imperative. We made a big mistake in our community. You know, we didn't know what community development program was. We just had a need and we knew we had to get together. So it's been a journey of working these out. But when you become the one-stop shop, everybody's going to look to you to solve all their problems. And that's in fact, that's not community. <coughs> that's about one group. Actually, you need all your groups participating. That's true community development. It's not looking to one trust to run the answers for your community, because you have many, from the Marae community to the whole people, everybody has to be part of participation or you create a learned helplessness again. They're looking to somebody else to do it for you. And actually, the key element is that you've got a whole lot of people with their passions doing their stuff. That's just the second part of that question. No, you shouldn't be threatened because you ain't the only bus on the stop. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, also, I totally agree with that. I think that like, we've got some amazing initiatives in the farm. Also, like um, Mike Finlayson's been here, and the ginger work he does out in the Hokianga, and you know, Kino, that, it's amazing. You know, he's really done an incredible job against the odds. Every year he goes out with his hand out to try and get money to, to do something that has, must be done. You know? And so, yeah, you don't want to take that away. You want to actually somehow get that together and make sure that the really good ones that are out there are you can identify them. Put them up there and say, this is how you do that. It's a really good model of how you do that and how many more people could do it. So it's not a market definitely not yet. Creativity doesn't come from one. Corporates don't go, all corporate businesses started off creative. It was a small family business at some stage. 
But you go to them now and they've lost their creativity. You know, that most of them have lost that they're going to be replaced. They've been, yeah, the bio boom because they've become bureaucracies. They haven't got it naturally. And so you want to keep refreshing. You want new things coming all the time. Other thing, question about assets, grab as much as you can. Assets are good, you know, like that's one of the biggest steps that we were able to move on when we when we went to some of our waste contracts, our first ones in our tour features, we had to borrow four or five hundred thousand dollars to get past go. If we didn't have a building in Kaitoa, we wouldn't have that helped us borrow against those. And so having assets, um, if the opportunity to come along, grab it. In the UK, they've got some amazing systems about acquiring assets, structures to, to get there. Oh yeah, um, so uh, in terms of the assets, um, there's a whole environment about how easy it is to, to do that. Um, I have a couple of points. Um, one is, uh, yes, at the moment, um, uh, local government in the UK is trying to get rid of assets. Some, sometimes they're liabilities. So there's a whole bunch of um, uh, funding and legislation which is enabling communities to take over uh, local assets. Yeah. Um, the legislation around uh, land acquisition is a, is a good example of that. Uh, but it's also working for community centres and line rates and all those things. Um, the, the second thing I would say though is um, you don't necessarily have to start with the building, it depends on what you're trying to achieve. And, um, and also that could be a long journey depending on what you're trying to do. So, um, so focus around what it is that you're trying to address first, uh, cohesion of vision um, around that, to bring people together doesn't necessarily have to start big. In fact, if you can get traction on some of the smaller stuff that you can demonstrate that you can collectively solve, um, that will give you momentum to be able to achieve some of the larger stuff. Um, and, and just around the order that that happens in is um, just to echo what you were saying about um, it's, the, it's the connections with the community which will enable this to happen. Um, and the assets may come after once you have a good business case or a good case for whatever social issues you're trying to resolve by creating that asset or owning that asset. So um, we can have a conversation afterwards, but you don't necessarily have to start with the place. It's, it's the people in it. But also, just to add to that, it's just working with what you've done. Seeing the vision and what you already have. Oh, you know, and um, I know for us in Moyo, uh, we, we started just with whatever was there and what we could get our hands on. And an opportunity came for us, like, where we could, you know, because <clears throat> at that time prices were very cheap in our town to uh, acquire buildings, you know, uh, sweat equity. Or, uh, but one of the things was your vision starts to come into what you do with your building, and then all of a sudden there's this new building, and then it becomes infectious. But it's actually, I think, start with where you're at, really around that, with what you have already in your hand and build from there. Um, just uh, picking up on what you've spoken about, um, Norm, um, I see housing um, as the biggest um, uh, problem at the moment um, in the um, issues that we see. Um, there is, uh, and Jane's spoken into some of the um, some of the issues around encouraging landlords to um, improve their premises. Um, we see um, lots of uh, transitory rentals, um, and um, in very unhealthy homes. Um, so, um, but with regards to. Um, um, unbiased information and um, solutions and options, I see that as being um, a particular need of geographically um, spread, isolated communities, and I'm going to include uh, my communities in Marae. Um, sometimes, you know, I can't even go to a tangi or stay the night because I think I'll die because it's so cold. Um, so, um, and with, re <laughs> with regards to the um, healthy homes option, just as an example of, of being able to dis disseminate um, good information um, regarding the healthy homes option, I think it was a couple of years ago, I, I just happened to see in an email that, um, that the um, applications were available for upgrades. So we 
printed out about 20 and gave them out in the community. Can we summarise, please? There was a good uptake, um, um, but it was very limited. So I'm saying that in order for our communities, our local communities to, um, to develop, can we um, link with you and we need access to unbiased information that can be presented to you. Uh, kia ora tātou, ko Carol Burden, Tōku Ingwa. Uh, questions to the panel. Um, we've heard a lot about social enterprise and um, it's very exciting stuff. And I remember a long time ago there used to be a lot of social enterprise in this, com in this community and the, the questions that I have relate around how closely is social enterprise li linked to the government policy of the day? Because now we only have those who have survived and, and um, they're there and then Ruben is a more recent one and I... I'm sure there are some other ones um, here too, but not to the degree that this community had it about 10 or 15 years ago. So the second thing is, what is it that we can do if we can't have a lot of social enterprise happening? What is it that we can do with social entrepreneurs? Because we've got a hell of a lot of social entrepreneurs in the very smallest pockets of our communities in the far north. And they're in Tutukehua, I see them in Motiti, I see all these Paikanai, I see Tahapua, I see them all here today. And is it, what is it that we can do, um, Shona, in making sure that um, if it's not social enterprise, because I, I, I would imagine at some point there'd be a tipping point, you can't have you know, one social enterprise in every community. But how is it that social enterprise can set up a campaign to help the whole lot of social entrepreneurs that are inside our community? Yeah, very interesting. Um, so um, the first part of that was how, how important is the environment in which social enterprises operate. Um, it's significant. Um, obviously, I think there's probably people better qualified to talk about the local context um, than me, but I, what I can do is draw a comparison to what happened in the UK. Um, the, the particular movement that happened was that um, chief executives of people that were running organisations which had... Um, triple bottom line, you know, these hybrids, um, were pioneering in their local communities. Um, and then they started to connect with each other. And it was just um, a, a handful of people that were leading organisations started talking to each other and saying, we really are doing something different here. And what we're, um, what we're learning um, and the way that we're doing this needs to be shared more broadly. And so it was just a couple of people in a room together, right, um, talking about the power of the model that they were creating, um, and then built that up, the local connections. Um, so networks, there's, there's a whole organisation in Scotland particularly dedicated to um, building and creating networks of social entrepreneurs. They are, um, they're national, they're regional, they're across sport, they're across disability, they're across, so they're thematic, they're, their um, highlands and islands. So, and it's, it's all about the people within that community learning from each other about how to operate within that community, learning about what's worked for them. So, so just like the rich information that's coming from the, from the panel in the room here, um, that happening on just a, a perpetual basis. That also gave them the leverage to go and lobby for the conditions that needed to be changed because it was more than one voice saying, this piece of legislation is preventing me from doing this. It was, it was a collective voice saying this piece of legislation is preventing us collectively do, from doing this. And that's when really significant change started to happen at national, um, national government and local government level. And it is in some of the technical practical stuff, which are, which are the preventions. Does that, does that answer the question? Good start. Good start. Yeah. Thank you, Shona. Peter? Well, just a very quick final comment. In, in larger centres such as Auckland and Wellington, social entrepreneurs tend to cluster together and finish up sharing office spaces and office buildings or in proximity. But your question is really good because it's made me realise that of course we know that there are social entrepreneurs, often you have to be very entrepreneurial to survive and get by in certain areas. And so what, what I'm, what I'm realising is that it's relatively easy for people in big centres the cluster and the way I've described, but um, we should maybe give some thought to how regional networks of people might, might be brought together. Can I, can I just add one other thing to that? Is there, there, 
there is infrastructure to support the networks in Scotland because what they realised is that entrepreneurs are busy um, and they're concentrating on what they do and it's quite hard for them to carve out time to go and collectively speak together when it's not a, an agenda, there's something to decide on the table. But they've still found it very useful. So um, there's uh, coordinators who, whose entire role is just to send out emails and get people to uh, get the bodies in the room. Um, not to dictate the, the, what happens in the room, but just to, to, to hold that space. Um, and so that's one of the tools that they use, and particularly in rural areas, it's, it's a necessary part of it, that there needs to be just a tiny bit of support which can bring all these people together. Thank you. A lot of the people, we, we're very kinesthetic learners, we learn hands on. If a lot of people can make sense, they're going to see it. So I think there's a lot of cross pollination with them, visit Firinaki or visit Muiwa or visit uh, Fanunga over here. It's actually given, because, you know, we always had, the, oh, I always had these uncles that used to invent all these things, you know. You know, the, 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 the capabilities were there, you know, uh, way back. But as I said, we were just carrying out somebody else's mandate. Now we're in the place where we can actually start about our vision. So I think working with what, and, and, and there's a wider scope from, you know, uh, from a, uh, a kind of global um, scale, but because you're working in a local locality, a lot of the stuff that local people are doing has relevance. And so that's what I think. It's actually like, you know, we did this as a people. We would visit each other when somebody had a good idea. We would talk to each other and then take that away and build on that. And our generosity as people, because actually social entrepreneurs, the word social is the first part of it. And so that's what we're about. You know, and you know, Cliff is a man with 50 billion ideas. And, you know, and he can't do them all. Or if you've got ideas, as I said, it's infectious. If you go and see, taste and see, and then you go away and you work it out. And that's really what it is. It's about, you know, having that itch you can't scratch. <laughs> you know, and, and you figure it out. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mahou. Peter? Yeah, kia ora tato. I'm uh, Peter Bruce from Whangarei. Also, oh, I'm originally from uh, Te Kopuru in the Northern Wairau, you know, another dying town. But um, there was some talk before about, about houses and warm houses, and I'm sure, I know that's a big part of the issue. The other part, though, with our kids and keeping them healthy is uh, what we feed them, you know? And it's really interesting to, you know, to connecting this to social enterprise, because when, when you look at what we eat here, we, we, we have failed to stem the flow of sugar into our, into our country and into our region, and, and, uh, and, and flour and stuff like that, you know? But uh, I've been working with the Whangarei Growers Market, and, and uh, one of the guys there was telling me that, Murray Burns, he was saying that, about 20 years ago, there were 20 tomato growers in Whangarei. Now there's one. You know, so the, these people, their industry has been decimated. And, and we continue to allow that to happen. Um, that, that is the other part of the, pro the, the thing. Because, you know, you can put your kids in a, in a dry house, but if you keep feeding them crap, they're not going to be healthy. They're going to, I mean, and, and, the, and the richest people are going to be, are going to be those people that are, that are you know, we're, we're, we're taking to the doctors and to the medical people now. We don't need to do that. So if we can, if we can sort of get uh, more cohesion and work together, th these are multiple solutions we can create and we can also employ our local people a lot better. Thank you, Peter. Could your microphone go to Neil, please, and Nicole? Yeah. Um, just following on from that, um, you're absolutely right. So one of the speakers yesterday talked about, about um, most about 5% of the food that we eat is grown in, Kai, in the far north in Kai Tai, and you buy it from growers markets and stuff like that. But in actual fact, most probably 50 to 60% of the food we eat is actually grown in the far north, but it goes out of town and back again. You know? So Australia, there's a, there's a huge amount of opportunities because the stuff is growing here and stopping it going out and just making it stay in the circuit, you know? And we might get better quality because we can influence people to grow it as well. Thank you, Cliff. Nicole? You were mentioning how people drive their houses and what sort of habits they have and how you might want to change those. I was wondering if you considered metering systems as part of the solution for that. There's a really interesting program I'd be more than happy to talk to you about in Woodstock, Ontario, which combined a prepayment metering system with instant feedback. So to, to give you a sense of why you would want to do this, imagine if we bought our groceries the way we buy electricity. 
You go to the store, there's no prices on anything. You put anything you want in the cart, and two months later they send you a bill for two months' worth of consumption. If your bill was too high, what would you do about it? You wouldn't have any information as to how to cut back on your consumption, because you don't know what were the expensive things in that cart. That's what we do with power. You give people feedback, put a meter in their kitchen that's really <coughs> readable, give them instant feedback, so that they can tell every time they use power, they can instantly see what effect that had and how fast their meter started spinning. And when they did this in Woodstock, they dropped consumption by 30% in the absence of any loans, any information, just because they made people into active consumers. So you got rid of the whole learned helplessness thing that, that you were talking about. Give people the information, and they will take charge of their own consumption. It's a bit like how you drive a Prius. <laughs> A, a Prius has a meter that tells you what every act of driving just did to your gas consumption. People who drive Priuses drive like little old ladies because they, they put the gas in the car, they have the power to spin that gas out for as long as possible. So it's an incredibly empowering thing. This, this is real smart metering. Not smart as in high tech, smart as in working with the psychological drivers that move people and that actually change behavior. So I'm interested in, in whether you've considered uh, metering systems like that as part of your solution. Thank you. You absolutely nailed it. Up to 20% of energy use can be uh, saved through no loss of services, through just switch off and smart activities. And as part of that whole of house package that we've talked about, um, some kind of metering which provides that feedback to support information and behavioural change is, is, is in the mix. Thank you. Thank you. Neil? Hi. Right. Um, it's so powerful, everybody in the room talking. Um, what I'm hearing, and what I heard yesterday, I heard yesterday it was 15% of local youth unemployed. Ruben identified it as one of the problems, or one of the challenges, one of the potentials. Everybody in the room talking, and now I'm hearing the housing. Housing is a challenge. We're going to do something about the housing. We've got lots of people unemployed. All right? So let me just take you out over to Brazil. There's a city there called Kiratuba. Kiratuba, third world country in, uh, in the 70s. And a creative person became mayor there in about 72. And they had a problem. They couldn't, third world, they had these um, slums and they couldn't get their waste trucks down the alleyways to clear it up. So what they did is they got a piece of paper and they gave it to the kids to run down to the end of the alley, bring the rubbish back, sort it out. And you know what they did? They didn't give millions of dollars to them, they gave them a piece of paper which says you could have a ticket for a bus ride into town. That's how they fought. And in the 90s, they got an award from the United Nations for the most environmental city in the world. And lots of city planners go there to find out how they did it. And one of the ways they did it was they had local currency. That was a local currency. You needed a piece of paper, like the $100 bill that Ken was talking about, to go around. So maybe we don't need those millions. We need to start with what we've got. Let's keep talking. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I just want to say that's uh, about $150 for those kinds of uh, uh, meters. And the idea is that you basically you, en you engage the children to, uh, to do the energy policing for you. You cut them in by giving them 10% of the savings. <laughs> Thank you. John? I am technologically challenged here. 
Um, just a point I'd like to make, uh, this is obviously one of the most important sessions for the people here today, the feedback, the activity, pe people getting involved with the conversation. And it's what we found with any transition town operation we've had, talking about building houses, warmth, heating, that sort of thing. has always been the biggest turn up, uh, turnout of people for any of our operations. One thing that I've come to realise, though, is that to do this, you've got to have the proper tools. And you were talking about this before. Now, the force, uh, having the kids healthy by getting to the homes first, I believe is back front. Because you're still working with dysfunctional tools. The dysfunctional tools you're working with are the present financial system. Now, I've been looking at this for many years now. I was very much of the idea that it was about getting hands in, in the dirt, doing it. That was the important thing. I've slowly come to the conclusion that the most single important thing we can do is change the dysfunctional monetary system, which will then give us the tools to make everything else go a hell of a lot easier. Just, I think that's an important point. Thank you, John. Now, two, two things, of course, is, is healthy housing and the cost of housing, because the cost of housing in New Zealand is crippling, um, in my experience. Uh, it's just too damn expensive, and we have to change that. Um, I don't know, community-owned trusts that build their own brand new healthy housing, but uh, how do you build uh, against the, the Fletcher Challenge kind of model and the monopoly they have over local authority planning decisions that you have to build like that? What about um, in a competition, the $40,000 house competition, um, that you could have an experimental lot here, get the designs in from all over the world and, and get local people to build them and build them and people will come from all over the place to come and visit them and see these houses. Uh, what hasn't been mentioned in the technology is passive solar design, so you don't need to heat your house. There, there's houses I visited here in the far north and there's no heating and it's warm day and night. Same as at the Rocky Mountain Institute, isn't it Norman, up there where, where it can frost all year round, very cold climate, and they're growing mangoes because they use NASA technology not to let any of that heat out, although I like a little more air in my house. But um, uh, you can make your own, I've, I've got, um, we put on display an architecturally designed warm wall, or trom wall, which just is a passive solar heat collector blowing 45 degrees of warm fresh air through a house in autumn and winter, dries the house out, but you could build them out of um, aluminium cans painted black, or I'm sure Seabeck will knock them out by lunchtime tomorrow, but yeah. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, John? Yes, thank you. Uh, somewhere in Canada, and um, our lovely friend here might be able to clarify this, uh, is a town that have, they formed a trust. They, uh, I don't know if they use alternative finance, I would imagine they probably do. But they buy up old properties, they do them up, and for a deposit as low as $3,000, they allow families to move into those homes. There's a, a, a very, very low uh, or an easy repayment system. There's only one prerequisite, and that is if and when the families ever decide to sell, they have to sell back to the trust. That's one point. And just to wind up, um, I'd just like to say that there's, so, there's more gold coming out of this room than is buried beneath us. And what I would very much appreciate is if the various panels that we've experienced and we're going to experience for the rest of the uh, day could get together and form one panel that could visit little places like Russell, where I come from, because there's so much has come out here. I'm the only representative from Russell, and I can't take this all back to all the people that need to hear it. Could you do that, please? Thank you. Thank you, John.